Okay, thank you very much. So I've been asked to give a, 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 a overview of the first unit of the Bhagavad Gita, which is chapters one to six. I understand. I understand you've already completed the unit. So I'll just take you through the main points of the chapter, of the section rather, six chapters. So, of course Bhagavad Gita begins with Dhritarashtra asking a question to Sanjaya because Dhritarashtra is not able to be there at the battlefield, he's in his palace. And by the grace of Vyasa, Sanjaya is able to see everything which is taking place on the battlefield. <coughs> you know, you put that AC on it, it's affecting me, you know, I can't handle it. Can you turn it off? Dhritarashtra is asking to Sanjaya, about the situation on the battlefield. He asks, of in the very first verse, he asks about, what did my sons and the sons of Pandu do? So the way he asks this question indicates his feeling, how he separates his sons from the sons of Pandu. Although they're meant to be all members of the one family, Still, Dhritarashtra is very much partial to his own sons and he's very much against the Pandavas. So this is uh, why the battlefield, why the battle is taking place. Of course, there's only one reason. Other things are also there, like the way they treated Draupadi and the dealings which they had in the past how they were always jealous of the Pandavas. And then Dhritarashtra, he is bitter because he's the eldest, he was the eldest of, between him and Pandu. But because Dhritarashtra was born blind, he was not considered suitable to be the king. So the throne was given to Pandu. But then when Pandu died, then the throne came back to Dhritarashtra. Although, he's, although, although he was blind, he was given the chance to rule, which meant that his sons could take advantage. So in this way, the scene is set for the battle. And then Sanjay begins to describe what's happening on the battlefield. And he describes how Duryodhan, meaning the oldest son of Dhritarashtra, the, the leader of the sons of Dhritarashtra, he is direct, he wants to inspire and encourage his soldiers to go out into battle with the mood of winning the battle. He wants to encourage them and at the same time he wants to warn them about the dangers which they face. So, Dhritarashtra, uh, Duryodhan points out some different things. For example, he, he says, uh, So behold the great, in text number three, it says, Behold the great army of the sons of Pandu, so expertly arranged by your intelligent disciple, the son of Drupada. This is where uh, Duryodhana is speaking to Drona. Drona. So Drona was a teacher. He said, Oh, my teacher. He's referring, talking to Dronacharya. And he said, Just look at this army arranged by the son, 
the sons of Pandu, it's arranged by your disciple. And who was that disciple? Of course, that was uh, Drishta Jumna. Drishta Jumna was born to kill Drona. So Duryodhana is pointing out some of the dangers. He wants to warn his uh, soldiers. Drona is fighting on the same side as Duryodhana and he warns him about the danger of uh, facing the enemy that Drishta Jumna is meant to kill Drona. So Drona has to be very careful. And then he refers to the great soldiers who are on the other side, people like Bhima and Arjuna. They're very powerful in battle, very strong. But Duryodhana says, in, my, in our army we also have great bowmen equal to them. So we shouldn't be worried about them. Duryodhana wants to encourage his soldiers. He doesn't want them to feel that they're on the, on the lower level, that they're less qualified. He wants them to be confident for the battle. It's just like, Duryodhana is like a coach. He's not going to go out into battle right away. He's sending the others out. He's sending Drona out. Even uh, Karn. Karn said he would not fight until all the other soldiers are dead. He said if he goes out to fight, he said then Bhima get, Bhishma gets the credit. So Karna didn't like that. He thought, when I fight, I should get the credit. But when I fight, the credit goes to Bhishma. <laughs> so in this way, Karna said, I'll fight only after Bhishma falls in the battle. And it was like that. Uh, so he mentions the names of so many great soldiers who are on their side. And this way he wants to encourage his army that they should feel confident that they can defeat the army of the Pandavas. Uh, we saw, we saw also, I, I didn't mention, but, but we saw the, 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 the generosity of the Brahmana, the fact that Drupad, uh, the, the fact that Drona accepted Drishta Jumna into his school. Drishta Jumna was born to kill him, but Drona still accepted him as his student. So that, that was the charitable nature of a Brahmana. Drona exhibited that nature by allowing the person who was going to kill him to be his student. You don't get too many brahmanas these days like that, who would have that mood. So in this way, the first chapter goes on and we will hear how uh, Arjuna, well, after hearing from Duryodhana, talking about how strong they are and how powerful, and pointing out the dangers, but then the, then we hear about how the conch shells begin to blow, and the blowing of the conch shells, and uh, the conch shell sound was tumultuous. So. Yes, Hare Krishna, you can mute. Okay. 
Yes, Hare Krishna, you can hear me? You can hear me okay? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, okay. All right, so uh, the sound of the conch shells, let everyone know that, that we're getting near to the beginning of the battle. And th there are different signs which indicated victory for the Pandavas even from the very beginning. The different auspicious signs were, first of all, that the battle was taking place at Kurukshetra, which is a holy place. And that's definitely going to favour the Pandavas more than the Kurus. The Kurus headed by Duryodhan, they're not so pious, they're, not, they're, they're materially they're alright, but spiritually they're not devotees. So the, the holy place was favouring the Pandavas. And then another point in the favour of the Pandavas was that the, the husband of the goddess of fortune, namely Lord Sri Krishna, was on the side of the Pandavas and he's driving the chariot for Arjuna of course. And then the third thing is the conch shells. The conch shells, the sound of the conch shells is a symbol of Lord Vishnu. And this is also auspicious for the Pandavas. And then Lord Krishna, he has a special chariot which was given to him by Agni the fire god and that chariot is indestructible. So that's also another great advantage for Arjuna and the Pandavas. So there are different omens there which all indicate that this battle is going to be in the favour of the Pandavas. So then we hear Arjuna express his doubts and his, he wants, Arjuna is feeling uncomfortable to go and take part in the battle. Uh, oh, another sign of victory for the Pandavas was Arjuna's flag, which was marked with Hanuman. So it, Arjuna, he always would he would always pray to Hanuman that just as you fought very well for the service of Lord Ram. Arjuna would pray, please let me also fight nicely in the service of Lord Krishna. So the point is we should always seek the blessings of the previous Acharyas. So in Arjuna's case the previous Acharya was Hanuman, therefore he was seeking the blessings of Hanuman in the coming battle at Kurukshetra. And then Arjuna then gives an, he asks, he tells Krishna, please bring my chariot into the middle of the battlefield. I want to see all these people who have come here desiring to fight. And that's also significant that Arjuna is giving instruction to Lord Krishna. Although Lord Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead and the controller of everyone, he allows his disciple, he allows his disciple like Arjuna to give him instruction. Lord Krishna reciprocates with his devotees. So in this way the Lord brought the chariot into the middle of the battlefield and at that time Arjuna witnessed, he could see his grandfather Bhishma and his uh, teacher Drona and he became bewildered. By the 
arrangement of Lord Krishna, he became bewildered and he expressed different reasons why he was reluctant to fight. The, the reasons were things like compassion. Arjuna felt, Arjuna felt very wrong for us to kill anyone. We should be compassionate. Arjuna also felt that if he, if he fought, he wouldn't enjoy the victory. There would be no happiness for him in fighting and winning the battle. Because if he wins the battle, it means he kills all the enemy. He's, he's going to go out to battle and fight. He's going to kill the enemy and walk off with the, with the kingdom. So this mood is not what Arjuna wants. Arjuna is a devotee and he's very conscious about his different actions. He wants to act in a manner which is satisfying for both himself and for the devotees for, and for Lord Krishna, of course. So Lord Krishna Lord Krishna is listening to Arjuna. Arjuna is expressing different reasons why he doesn't want to fight. And the first reason which he gives is compassion. Then the second reason was he said he, he was worried about sinful reactions. Certainly devotees, we will also be concerned about sinful reactions. We don't want to act in a manner in which we're going to get any sinful reactions. We want to avoid sinful reactions. We like to avoid karma. So Arjuna was worried that if he fought, he would kill people and there would be reactions for that. And another reason was, he said, he said I won't enjoy the kingdom. If I go and fight, I win the battle. I won't enjoy the kingdom because in order to enjoy the kingdom, I'll have to, I'll have to be away from all the other devotees. I'll be separated from everyone. I'll be on my own. And after the battle, all the older people will be dead. I, I, I'll feel, I won't feel good about everybody being dead. And I won't be able to enjoy the kingdom. I have no one to show it off to because everyone will be dead, except, except, for my, uh, except for the Pandavas. So this was Arjuna's reasoning. And another reason was he was worried also, mentioned there in the first chapter, about the degradation which would come on the, um, upon the different family members, how they would all be, they could all be degraded that if the older people die, then the younger people will give up all their religious practices and they'll become irreligious and immoral. The, when they become irreligious, then they will take to sinful activities and then the women will also follow them. The women will follow the men. And when the women become also involved in sinful activities, then they may also become pregnant. In other words, they have children without being properly married. So this is what is called varna, san, san, varna sankara, means unwanted population. So Arjuna spoke like that. He thought that I don't want to encourage this kind of thing. And if I do encourage all this killing and that, that every, everyone becomes degraded, then, then the, all the acts of charity and the uh, different pious activities which are usually performed by our communities will all stop. Everything will stop and will be... And, and that Arjuna thought, this is not good, I, I don't want to be responsible for all that. So in this way Arjuna, at the end of the chapter, he puts down his Kandiva bow and says, I don't want to fight. And so this, this is the conclusion, the end of the first chapter. Arjuna is saying, I don't want to fight, 
uh, he puts down his Gandiva bow, although he vowed that he would never put down his Gandiva bow, he puts it down and he uh, is not willing to fight. So then we come to the second chapter and we will hear how Lord Krishna begins to preach to Arjuna and he tells to Arjuna that he is surprised that Arjuna could act in this way, he could behave in a manner like he's full of impurities. He doesn't know the real value of life. Lord Krishna is not impressed with Arjuna speaking, rather he feels that this is not proper at all. Text number two, Lord Krishna says, this is not at all befitting a man who knows the value of life. They lead not to higher planets but to infamy. So you can see Lord Krishna somewhat mildly chastising Arjuna. But uh, Arjuna replies to Krishna, he says, well Bhishma and Drona, they're worthy of my worship. Arjuna is thinking that uh, Lord Krishna is famous as a killer of the demon Madhu, Madhusudana. He said, I don't want to be Dronadara and, and Bhishmadara. I don't want to be famous for killing the, the, uh, my teacher and killing my grandfather. That will not be good. But anyway, the, the crucial text comes, text number seven, where Arjuna surrenders himself to Krishna and he understood the problem that he said, because of my miserly weakness, <laughs> right? Uh, Karpanya dosho pahata swabhava. So doshas, faults. Arjuna said, I have faults. My fault is that I'm miserly. I, I don't want to risk my life in this, in, in this way. But Arjuna understood that this is wrong, that this is miserly, that he shouldn't think like that because he's a Kshatriya, he's meant to be bold, he's meant to, he's, he should have courage and he should be willing to go out into the battle and to die. But he said, how can I do it? But anyway, he knows he's bewildered about the principles of religion. And so he asked Lord Krishna, he said, I am your disciple and a soul surrendered unto you, please instruct me. So Lord Krishna immediately takes the position of a teacher and he begins to chastise Arjuna. And he tells Arjuna that, oh, you're speaking such nice words, but the words you're speaking are not worthy, they're not worthy of uh, anything, that what you're speaking has no real meaning, no real value, because you're lamenting for the temporary body. Now the body is certainly full of ignorance. You're lamenting for it, it's going, it, it, it is temporary. What is the point of worrying about the body? We have to understand the nature of the body. And so Lord Krishna first of all chastises Arjuna that he was lamenting for what wasn't worthy of lamentation and then Lord Krishna explains the eternal nature of the soul. And the first chapter, the second chapter rather, uh, Lord Krishna begins his teaching by explaining a very basic part of the philosophy. He explains the difference between the body and the soul. He wants all of us to understand the difference between the body and the soul. So that is explained the beginning of the second chapter. And there's a lot of nice sections, nice verses there. Lord Krishna is speaking about compassion because Lord Krishna has to defeat Arjuna's different arguments. So Lord Krishna is saying, what's the point of being compassionate for the body? You should be compassionate for the soul. Real compassion is not based on the body, it should be based on the soul, it should be on the spiritual platform. There's no point in being compassionate for the body, body's going to die anyway. 
whether you like it or not, the body's going to die. So we should think more and take more care of the soul. That is the real purpose of spiritual teachings. So Arjuna makes, uh, Lord Krishna makes this point to Arjuna. Arjuna was thinking being compassionate is a good thing, but Lord Krishna said, no. He said, that's not the business of a Kshatriya. Compassion may be good for a Brahmana, but not for a Kshatriya. Kshatriya should be bold and they should be willing to fight. So then Lord Krishna goes on to speak about uh, if, if a Kshatriya will fight, he will go to, even if he loses in the battle, he will go to heaven. He'll get that result that he can go to heaven. If he's killed in the battlefield, it's a glorious death for a Kshatriya. So Kshatriyas, they, they like that, they want to die on the battlefield. They'd rather die on the battlefield than die on the bed, lay on the bed in a hospital somewhere full of tubes. That is not very glorious. But, so Arjuna is hearing from Lord Krishna, Lord Krishna is telling Arjuna the importance of performing one's duty that you have to do your duty and you have to do it in a detached way. That's very important to, to perform the work and not to be attached to the results. So Lord Krishna then goes on to speak about karma yoga and how if you work and offer the results for Krishna, then there's no reaction. So in this way Lord Krishna is replying to Arjuna's different doubts. Compassion was defeated by the knowledge of the soul, understanding the eternal nature of the soul. So that was Arjuna's first argument. The second argument was Arjuna was saying that I won't enjoy if I fight. But Lord Krishna explains to Arjuna that if you fight you will enjoy whether you win or lose. If you win the battle, then you will enjoy the kingdom. And if you lose the battle, then you'll die on the battlefield. And if you die on the battlefield, then you go to heaven, you, you get liberation. So either way, if you fight, you'll be happy, you will, you'll get good results. But if you don't fight, then you'll be known as a coward and people will scorn your ability they will condemn you, they will criticize you, they will laugh at you, and you'll be disgraced. And for one who's been honored, dishonor is worse than death. So Arjuna was taught by Lord Krishna in this way. Uh, Arjuna seeing his different arguments all crumble by the powerful preaching of Lord Sri Krishna. Lord Sri Krishna is convincing all of us in the need to fight and, and, and surrender to Lord Krishna's lotus feet. And then Arjuna was worried that he won't enjoy if he fights. But Lord Krishna explains, if you fight you will enjoy. <coughs> oh, well, I explained that, right? I explained. If you win, you'll enjoy the kingdom and if you lose, you'll go to heaven. Both ways you'll enjoy. But if you don't fight, then it's a disgrace. So enjoyment will be there. And then the other reason why he didn't want to fight, sinful reactions. So Lord Krishna explains karma yoga. That if you fight in karma yoga, there's no reaction. <coughs> if you work for the pleasure of the Lord and offer the results to the Lord, then there's no sinful reactions. So that's a very important point. That's the power of doing karma yoga, that you don't get sinful reactions from your work. If you do other yogas, then you get reactions. But if you do bhakti yoga, no reactions. So Lord Krishna is encouraging Arjuna that, no, he says karma yoga, Karma Yoga will deliver you from all kinds of material reactions. 
So, and then finally, uh, the, greatest, the Arjuna's argument about the degradation of the dynasty would come and there would be unwanted population. So Lord Krishna will defeat that argument. It comes in the third chapter though. Uh, Lord Krishna explains that if you fight, then you're setting a good example for others. But if you don't fight, then you're setting a very bad example for others. Other people will follow you and then the, the Varna Sanskar will be in a more hellish situation. If you don't fight, then all the other people who come, they'll see, oh, all these other people, they didn't fight, oh, why, why are we fighting? A devotee should understand he fights only for the pleasure of Krishna. He doesn't worry about the results, he doesn't worry about what's happening, he's just thinking about his service to Krishna. Let me work on behalf of Lord Krishna, then everything will be good. But if we don't fight, then we will be scorned, people will mock us. Nobody will say, oh, very pious, he didn't fight. They will say he was afraid, that's why he didn't fight. So we have to understand the situation, not to be caught, not to fall into the illusion that we're wrong, that it's wrong to fight. Violence is sometimes necessary, it cannot be avoided. We have to use that in the service of Lord Krishna. All right, so second chapter is like that. We'll go on to the third chapter. Third chapter, we will hear about karma yoga. All right, karma yoga, action in Krishna consciousness. Isn't it? Uh, chapter three, yeah. Oh, no, chapter three, karma yoga. Okay, so the chapter begins with some karma yoga and then with some karma kanda and then karma yoga is described. Karma kanda is different. Karma kanda remembers material activity. We have to we do things to enjoy the results. And so for the purpose of living in the world there has to be grains, there, have, there has to be the crops have to grow, all of these things. We have to till the fields, we have to plant the seeds, we have to take care of the plants when they grow and then we have to harvest everything also. So a lot of work is involved and we have to depend on the Lord for all of these things. Everything comes about by the grace of the Lord and we have to do that, this work, for His pleasure. So Lord Krishna is encouraging Arjuna to work. After describing karma, karma kanda, he speaks about karma yoga and he describes about how we get grains. He said, if all, everyone lives on food grains, but in order for grains to grow, there has to be rain. And in order to get rain, we have to do yajna, there has to be sacrifice. And then when, when there's rains, then the crops will grow nicely and people can just get the proper food, everything, all their needs can be taken care of. So it's important to do yajna. Yajna is born of, of prescribed duty. And Lord Krishna wants Arjuna to do this yajna, his yajna, Arjuna's yajna, is to fight, he's a Kshatriya, he's meant to fight. So Lord Krishna goes on speaking about uh, an Atmarama, a, 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 a person who is self-realized, who is taking pleasure in the self, he has no material desire. The Lord Krishna describes how such a person can work in this world, he can live in this world but he's not on the same platform as the common man because he's taking pleasure in himself, he's taking pleasure in the soul. His happiness is within, not externally. So Lord Krishna describes how a devotee will relate to such a person, how sometimes even they can go together for preaching. 
And then Arjuna, he, he asks a question which comes there in the third chapter. Uh, he wants to know, how can we avoid sinful activities, even unwilling, as if engaged by force? Arjuna wants to understand how the material nature forces him to engage in activities which are not really proper. This is a, a problem in the material world. We, we often do some things, we do activities which we regret. Uh, but at the same time, we, we don't know why we did it. Arjuna says we did it unwilling, as if engaged by force, that some higher nature was forcing us to do it. Of course, it, it may be like that. That is our contact with the material energy. Through our contact with the material energy, we appear to be forced. We appear to be engaged in so many different ways and different activities in this material world. So it's very difficult for us to know what to do. Anyway, Lord Krishna goes on and describes how the self-realized soul can act, how did, the, the Arjuna wanted to know how does he speak, how does he walk, what is his language. Anyway, before the end of the chapter, Lord Krishna will describe how we, why we perform sinful activities. And it's all due to lust. And lust is described as the eternal enemy. It burns like fire, it's never satisfied. And it's seated, the lust is seated, we're also told where to find it. It can be in the senses, it can be in the mind, it can be in the intelligence. And how to conquer that lust? Lord Krishna also gives us the solution how we can conquer lust by regulating the senses and cultivating transcendental knowledge. Not just simply on an academic platform, but on a platform of real devotion. We should develop that kind of consciousness. Alright, so that's the third chapter. Then chapter 4 goes on. Chapter 4, Transcendental Knowledge. We will hear in chapter 4, uh, well we'll hear the history first of all of the Bhagavad Gita, how Lord Krishna spoke this knowledge to the Sun God Viviswan, then Viviswan gave to Manu, Manu gave to Ikshvaku, And then from Ikshvaku came to the kings, different Rajashis on the planet. So the history of the Bhagavad Gita is given. But then we heard Yoga Brasta Padayati, that the knowledge was lost and there was a need to re-establish it. So Lord Krishna describes his mission that he comes to re-establish religious principles because they, they often fall. So the Lord comes, he, he will give pleasure to his devotees, at the same time kill the demons and re-establish the religious principles. And then we hear about different kinds of sacrifices which take place. And it's pointed out that we may sacrifice physical things or we can also satisfy people on this, on this, on the on the mundane level, uh, we can satisfy people by giving them knowledge and we can also give people transcendental knowledge. So different sacrifices are suggested for different people in different positions in society. They will perform sacrifice in different ways. And it's pointed out that the sacrifice of material possessions is not as great as the sacrifice of knowledge. 
the sacrifice of knowledge is very powerful to cultivate knowledge in this material world. And then the end of the chapter we will hear about the nature of transcendental knowledge. Transcendental knowledge. That uh, it burns, uh, uh, transcendental knowledge burns up all sinful reactions to material activities. That is the nature of transcendental knowledge. It destroys sins. So we, we do need transcendental knowledge. That, of course the famous verse is in the 34th verse where Lord Krishna says, just try to learn the truth. In, inquire from me and render service unto me. Self-realized soul has seen the truth and can impart knowledge unto us. So that's the fourth chapter, oh, yeah, the nature of transcendental knowledge. And then the, the fifth chapter, we hear about still karma yoga, actually it's more buddhi yoga. The fifth chapter is more like buddhi yoga because it's karma yoga with transcendental knowledge. So that's something very important to get uh, transcendental knowledge as early as possible in our devotional life. If we can learn this knowledge earlier in life then we can save ourselves from so many miseries in the material world. So the fifth chapter explains about how the Lord is interacting with the material nature and all of his devotees. Particularly in uh, our temples in the big cities, the devotees are able to get regular classes and regular teaching and they can cultivate transcendental knowledge. And with that transcendental knowledge, they can cross over the ocean of material existence. So the fifth chapter ends with the peace formula, the very important verse at the end of the fifth chapter. Lord Krishna said you can get peace if you know three things. You have to know Krishna is the proprietor, Krishna is the enjoyer and Krishna is our best friend. If you can remember these three things then you can be happy in life, you can, your life can be successful. So that's at the end of the fifth chapter and then the sixth chapter comes and in the sixth chapter we're going to hear about meditation through the Astanga Yoga process. You can see already on the, that some offerings have been made for these devotees, just simple foodstuffs, mostly fruit and so on. So in the sixth chapter Lord Krishna is going to explain about Astanga Yoga and how we can come to the, trans the higher position by transcendental knowledge. If we cultivate the process of Bhakti Yoga, then if we follow all the different rules and regulations and so on, we should be able to come to the perfection of yoga. The different yoga systems are compared to a ladder. At the bottom of the ladder is the karmakanda process, it's not on the ladder. Then at the bottom of the ladder, lower rug, you've got karma yoga. Above karma yoga you've got jnana yoga and above jnana yoga, astanga yoga. So. Astanga Yoga is the sixth chapter and you'll see from Astanga Yoga we go on, we come to Bhakti Yoga. That once we are meditating on the Super Soul and we understand the Super Soul to be separate from us, then we will want to render service to the Super Soul. We want to give up our own material position and 
simply take shelter of the Lord's service. That is the good realization of yoga. From Astanga Yoga, if you become the servant of the Super Soul, then you can go on to the topmost level of yoga, Bhakti Yoga. And Lord Krishna confirms that at the end of the sixth chapter. In the sixth chapter, Lord Krishna also talks about the mind and how the, it's very important to control the mind. Mind can be the friend, the mind can be the enemy. We have to control the mind. One who has conquered the mind, mind is the best of friends. One who has failed to do, to do so, his mind is the greatest enemy. So how do we conquer the mind? In the Kali Yuga, we conquer the mind simply by chanting the holy name, by chanting Hare Krishna mantra. Hare Krishna, 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 Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare. So the, the chanting of the holy name is very powerful, it helps us to concentrate the mind on the Supreme Lord. So Lord Krishna describes the perfection of yoga is to come to that stage of samadhi where we are fully absorbed in thought of the Lord and we simply want to engage in his service. Arjuna, however, has a question, very important question there in the sixth chapter. Arjuna's question is about what happens if a person is not successful in yoga? What happens if he gives up everything and he takes to the path of yoga but he's not successful? So Lord Krishna describes two situations. He said, if you practice just for a short time, then what will happen is you'll go to higher, after you give up the body, you'll go to higher planets, you will enjoy there in the higher planets, and then you'll come back to the material world, to this level, earthly planet, and you'll take birth in a wealthy, an aristocratic family, where you can again have the opportunity to take up the yoga practice. That is for someone who practiced only for a short time. But for someone who's practiced for a long time, then they will take birth in their next life. They'll be born in a family of devotees. So from the very beginning of their life, they have the opportunity to become a devotee. And they're trained from the very beginning. So Prabhupada always taught us that the children of our devotees are very important they're very special souls who are taking birth. That in their previous life they were already somewhat advanced in yoga and now they're coming, they're taking birth in a devotee family. And of course Srila Prabhupada was born in a devotee family and so Prabhupada's guru was also Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati. They were both born in the family of devotees. So it's a very uh, nice thing to be born in a devotee family and to be brought up in Krishna consciousness from the beginning of life. But it's even better that if we can make f proper use of this human life and go back to Godhead. That is the real success. Not that we want to take birth in a family of devotees, but we want to go back to Godhead. We want to serve Krishna eternally in the spiritual world. And to, to do that, we have to come to the, the topmost level of the yoga ladder. So the sixth chapter concludes with Lord Krishna describing that bhakti yoga is at the top of the yoga ladder. The other yoga processes are all included in bhakti. One who is a bhakti yogi, he is also a karma yogi. He is also karma yogi, remember, they're detached to, from the results, they offer the result for Krishna. So one who does bhakti also does that. And one who does bhakti is also a jnana yogi, he has knowledge, he knows about the Lord, he knows about the material nature, he understands that the process of creation and the inconceivable potency of the Lord. So one who is a bhakti yogi is also a jnana yogi, he has that knowledge. And he is also an astanga yogi. The astanga yogi, he fixes, fixes his mind on the Supreme Lord. He's always remembering the Lord. So one who's doing bhakti, he's also constantly 
absorbed in thought of the Lord. So all of these different lower levels of yoga, they're all included in the process of bhakti. And in this way bhakti is at the top of the yoga ladder. Alright, so this is my summary of the first six chapters of the Bhagavad Gita. Are there any questions, anybody? Hare Krishna. Uh, uh, out of these six chapters, I'm, I'm asking you a basic question, Prabhuji. Uh, what would you suggest to do Krishna devotees? Like, consider me uh, as a neutral person now. I'm entering into the path, Krishna path. Uh, if, if I say your state is uh, your surrender to Lord Krishna, and uh, yeah, you are a full devotee of Lord Krishna, but as a neutral person, what would you suggest me to do the first thing to uh, towards to surrender Lord Krishna? What's the first thing you ask me, you suggest me to do? Well, the first thing to do is to find a devotee who will guide you, who will help you to surrender to Krishna. Somebody who has already surrendered to Krishna and they can, they can help you and guide you how you, how you need to surrender to Krishna. We need that association, we need a senior Vaishnava who can guide us. Thank you so much Maharaj. Uh, thank you so much for quickly summarizing in this, this short time of this uh, one hour, all the six chapters so beautifully. So very, very, really grateful to you. Anyone else has any, any question? Ayusha, please uh, use this opportunity. We will not get. Yes, Jesu, uh, uh, please have a point of view. Hare Krishna Prabhuji, uh, I have questions, small questions. <coughs> Is it possible uh, for us uh, to go to directly uh, up the yoga position? Because uh, we do not have that knowledge, and uh, with this uh, uh, so busy schedule, we are not able to collect all the knowledge, we cannot read all the scriptures. And we are not able to understand also because of our limited uh, mind and uh, limited knowledge. Is it possible, Prabhuji, to go to uh, Akti Yoga? Because uh, it is very time taking to collect all the knowledge, and we are not able in the uh, position to get all the knowledge to understand. So it is there. Well, it's encouraged that we should go. To bhakti first of all. We won't get all the knowledge immediately but gradually as you go on you get a little more, a little more, a little more, gradually it will increase. What is important is that we should take shelter of Lord Krishna by the bhakti process. Yes, our knowledge may not be perfect and, and especially in the beginning we won't have a lot of knowledge. But just the fact that we have faith in Krishna and that we take shelter of Krishna, that is very powerful and that protects us. Krishna helps us. Krishna takes care. We don't know but Krishna knows everything and Krishna can reveal everything to us. So it's important. And the thing if you go other processes, you get no benefit at all. You don't get anywhere. You make progress very slowly, very difficult. But if you go to bhakti, you take the bhakti, the, you can make progress very quickly. Okay, there's a, there's one question here from Nimai. Maharaj, you said that if we have to yagya and then we get the rain. So that from rain we get the crops and we get the necessities, pulses, grains for eating and for living. But then in uh, when Krishna came in Dvapar Yoga, he uh, like he did not do the yagya for Indra Dev. Instead he did yagya for Govardhan. But then we should 
Then Nimai's question is uh, about Lord Krishna, that Lord Krishna stopped the worship of Indra. So if you don't worship Indra, you don't get rain. But we should understand Lord Krishna is the Supreme Controller, the Supreme Lord. His position is above Indra. Indra is his servant. Lord Krishna is not the servant of Indra. Lord Krishna doesn't need to worship Indra. And one who worships Krishna, they also don't need to worship Indra. Because by worship of Lord Krishna, all the devas are all satisfied. All the demigods are satisfied when we worship Lord Krishna. Lord Krishna is like the root and the devas, the different demigods are just like leaves and branches on the tree. So we do need to take shelter of the, the we do need to take shelter of uh, Lord Krishna. And there's no offence to Indra. <laughs> Rather Indra is pleased when we, when we worship Lord Krishna. All the demigods are pleased when they see us worship Krishna because they're all satisfied. But if how many demigods can you worship? You can't worship many demigods. But if you worship Krishna, they're all satisfied. So you don't have to worry. Lord Krishna was not doing anything wrong when he stopped the Indra Yagya. He was just correcting the pride of Indra. It was a Leela, it's a Leela. Don't think there was any fault. Okay. Hare Krishna, Maharaji, Tanvat Pranam, Maharaji. Uh, Maharaji, my question is that uh, we should offer uh, the results of our activities to Lord Krishna. That is said, but in case, uh, in certain circumstances, if it is not possible, do we have to suffer the reactions of our karma, Prabhuji? <laughs> Well, if you're doing something for Krishna, there's no karma. If you're dedicating your, your work and the result, if, if, if everything you're doing is meant for Krishna's pleasure, there's no karma. You don't get karma if you're worshipping Krishna. You're free of karma, you destroy all the karma by your worship of Krishna, by chanting Hare Krishna, by surrendering to Krishna, then all the karma is going to be destroyed. That is the power of devotion to Krishna. Do you understand Gayatri? Thank you so much, Maharaj. Now, just uh, if you have time, we will take this last question from Prashish Mataji. Yes, Mother Mataji, uh, please. Uh. Hare Krishna, Mataji. Mataji, Tanvat Pranam. Uh, Maharaj, I have a question. Uh, uh, if the family is into demigod worship and they worship Krishna as also one of the demigods, how to make them understand that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of the Godhead and He is above all and He is the cause of all causes, Maharaji? Yes. Then we have to introduce them to scriptures like Bhagavad Gita. We have to explain to them different pastimes, how Krishna, Lord Krishna dealt with the different demigods. For example, the Indra Yagya, uh, the go lifting of the Govardhan hill to defeat Indra, 
so and then also Lord Brahma, Lord Brahma stole away the cows and the cowherd boys, Lord Brahma became illusioned, the Brahma Vimohan Lila. And then also Nanda Maharaj was arrested, taken to Varuna. Lord Krishna went to see Varuna to get his father released from Varuna. Lord Krishna fought with Lord Shiva and they fought, how they fought, Lord Krishna defeated Lord Shiva, right? Lord Shiva's weapon was not able to overcome the weapons of Lord Krishna. Lord Shiva's weapon was burning everything. Lord Krishna came with a weapon which froze everything. So and many all the different demigods there there were there were all there were so many incidents they tried to fight Krishna they tried to oppose Krishna Krishna always came out victorious so we can just point out to them all of these different instances along with scriptural information and along with the fact that so many great personalities they all worship Krishna there's also the story of Brigamuni. Brigamuni was sent to test Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva and how he ended up coming to Lord Vishnu and even after he kicked Lord Vishnu in the chest, Lord Vishnu was not angry at him. But Lord Krishna, but the, the, the Brigamuni was, was so surprised. Everywhere he found Brahma was a, a angry and Shiva was angry, but Lord Vishnu, who had the most, the, he was treated the hardest, he was the most gentle, the most kind. He didn't get angry at all. Another pastime is how Mahavishnu was stealing away the children of a Brahmana. Mahavishnu himself wanted to see Lord Krishna because Lord Krishna is the supreme, he's the source of everything. So there, like that, many different pastimes are there to give evidence of the supreme position of Lord Krishna. So you can try to point out these things to people. Okay, Maharaj. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Lord, give me precious time, Maharaj. Spiji, since past many days he has been preaching in Dubai, in, in India, and Actually, he has been giving class, but in spite of his busy schedule, he agreed to give class to all of us. Uh, we are really grateful to you, Maharaj. And I hope that with your blessings, all of our participants will be able to clear the exams with the good marks. Yes. Uh, so let us. Yes, Maharaj, you say something. Yes, I, I wish you all blessings and hope you study nicely and go on. Go on, study, and then teach. Okay, Hare Krishna. Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai. Okay, Hare Krishna. Finished, right? Okay. Krishna, sorry, Krishna, when uh, uh, he was uh, this uh, Indra Lila, past times so with Indra, so Indra understood and Indra apologized. And uh, the same uh, Indra, when uh, Krishna has gone to Swarga for bringing Parijata, again the same Indra part. So, he forget or is it past time or what is the significance for us? Well, the significance is that even, you know, how, how proud people are, they, they become attached. They, they you know, have a little position in the material world, they become so proud and attached, they're thinking even...